He'll make it for sure. Now that's why I backed him on Tap Touch. Hey, Luke. Yes, Gene Simmons. He's probably the best when it comes to this stuff. Thanks, Gene. You've got the touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Chances are you're about to lose. For free and confidential support, call 1 800 858 858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. Hello and welcome to Hoop Seven's Basketball Hustle and another massive week in the NBL for us to dissect here on the show and three more weeks now until the end of the regular season and we still are no closer to knowing which teams will make the top six. It's a remarkably tight, tight season and we'll try to try to figure some things out on this week's show. I'm once again going to be joined by Simon Mitchell as we look back on a crazy Thursday night of upsets back in around 17 the Sydney Kings, the most wildly unpredictable team in the competition. Good luck figuring, figuring out what you're going to get from them any given night. And then, like I said, a fascinating race for the top six positions now with three rounds to go. We're here thanks to Hoop7 and Tab Touch. As always, I'm Chris Pike, but delighted to be joined once again by the former Southeast Melbourne Phoenix head coach of the last four years. Simon, what did you make of what we saw last weekend, and especially that Thursday night? Were you left shaking your head about what we saw? I was uh, I was left shaking my head about myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and any of the punters that listened mm. and took any advice that I had for them last week. That's what, that's what I was shaking my head about. I was I've been going all right this year actually for mm-hmm. a season that's pretty tight. The tips have been pretty good, but I had an absolute howler in round seventeen, <laughs> particularly. On that Thursday night, with uh, the Phoenix beating the Kings and the Hawks really putting it to the Perth in uh, in what's been their bogey arena over the last thirty yeah. years too, yeah. well, bogey state. Yes, moving up to the RSC arena. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I've, I've disappointed some people out there. <laughs> uh, you, you're being harsh on yourself, Simon, because I don't think there's anyone in the country that could have predicted that. Not only probably even that one of the Phoenix or the Hawks would would win, let alone both of them. I mean. Just checking the tap touch odds throughout the day last Thursday, the Phoenix blew out to about six dollars fifty by the time that game tipped off, and the Hawks were somewhere in the four dollar range. They were the biggest outsiders of the season, just about both of them. We we talked we talked last week, and let's get straight straight into it now with the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix. And you talked about how it had been tough watching the past couple of weeks, and you just wanted to see them show some fight, show some heart, and show some competitiveness. And and again, they were without Gary Brown, without Abdul Nader, without. Alan Williams, without Matt Kenyon, without Craig Moller. And they did a lot more than just show some fight and spirit against the Sydney Kings. They completely outplayed them. For someone that's been so closely linked to that team for the last four years, you must have been beaming with pride as you watched watched what they did on Thursday night. Oh, I was thrilled for them. Mm. Um, I was thrilled thrilled for the organisation as a whole. Um, Tommy Greer, really happy for him. Um, Really happy for, for Mike and the coaching staff. Uh, the players, I was wrapped in the kids, you know, like Creek and uh, Creek and Ben Eyre were both outstanding, but mm-hmm. I, I was just thrilled with Foxwell and Rosendale and Statman. Um, I thought they were, those three were really, really solid in their performances. And uh, happy for the faithful too, who, mm-hmm. who've been doing it pretty hard for the month. And, um, you know, it kept turning up. It was another sold-out crowd. And uh, I know it's the, the smaller venue in the State Basketball Centre, but it was it was loud, it was raucous, and mm. um, yeah, it was a great great night for the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix. And you know, I think they've set themselves a bar now of what's acceptable. Yeah, I think so too. They showed what that heart can can sort of overcome pure talent in some ways. And then backing up on Thursday night, the Illawarra Hawks delivered a terrific performance to beat the Wildcats. Like you talked about, it's been a whether it's Challenge Stadium or now RSA Arena, it's been a horrible trip for the Hawks to make for pretty much thirty years, but. The game plan was terrific from Justin Tatum. Second time now they've come with a similar game plan to basically deny Bryce Cotton the ball. So they've got a couple of bigger defenders. They double team him, they triple team him and deny him the ball and almost dare anybody else to beat them and nobody else could beat them. They dominated the Wildcats who, as we talked about last week, had been in some pretty hot form. What did you make of what the Hawks did? Yeah, they kind of set a bit of a blueprint and and you see that throughout the league. You know, we've seen teams that... uh, have done well against other oppositions, and that's you know the second time now that we've seen Illawarra really do a good job against uh, Bryce and Perth. 
And, you know, we've seen Cairns previously against Melbourne, you know, where they devise a game plan. Now, one thing is to devise the game plan, game plan and the, the other thing is that they have the personnel that can execute it. And yeah. uh, the Hawks do a great job of rotating players through on Bryce Cotton. Um, but you've got to have those players to, to, to go through there and, you know, you know mining Swackle Bullock yeah. and then they go with smaller players. It, it, it's just a different look that they give him at all times and, and they're very aggressive and... They did a great job, and that's the second time that we've seen them do that. And, uh, yeah, if the other teams have the personnel, mm. then uh, we'll see them try and replicate. The other thing that stood out to me from the weekend was just the, the crazy gap from the best and the worst of the Sydney Kings. I don't think any other team comes close to their worst being as bad as theirs and their best being as good. And that's why a couple of weeks back you still talked about how you thought they still could put it all together to be a championship-calibre team because of their ability but then they put in a performance like that against the Phoenix, which was horrible. And then three days later, they beat Melbourne United and put in a terrific performance. How do we how do we know what to expect from them? Well, we don't. I think uh, they're, they're a team that's hard to trust right now. Um, the performance Thursday night, and uh, we'll go into it, I'm sure, a little mm. later in, in more detail. But it was, I mean, I think most people would have thought it was losing the unlosable. Yep. It wasn't. They've shown these signs for, for a number of weeks now. They can be tremendously poor mm. at the defensive end, disengaged, and they're one of those teams that their defense will look a little better if their offense is cranking. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not the sign of a championship team. Championship teams have got that consistency regardless. You know, if the, if the offense is, if the ball's not dropping for them, they'll just stop you. You know, that's their mentality. The Sydney Kings seem to be, you know, a little got that little bit of a millionaire attitude that. Oh, yeah, if the ball goes through the hoop, we can stop you a little bit. But you know, having said that, they shot the ball at a reasonable rate against uh, South East Melbourne. But I think there's a bit of arrogance there as well that they're always going to be good enough to get over the top. But unfortunately for them and their fans, they weren't. No, no. Um, just lastly, then we'll go through the results. It's remarkable how tight this season is. I mean, you've got Melbourne and Perth out on top, but everybody else technically could still make at least a play-in game. So you've got Tasmania in third at, on 12 wins. You've got South East Melbourne last on... 10 wins, and everyone else is in between. So everyone's either 12, 11, or 10 wins. It's a remarkably tight season. I mean, we'll go through the run home of all these teams later, but is this the dream situation for the NBL to have such a tight season where you actually don't know who's going to win any game any given night? And right now, you don't know which of those eight teams are going to be making either the top four or top six. Well, yeah, it's funny you bring this topic up. For, for discussion because I, as you may know, I, I have my five things to love about yes. the NBL that I tweet each week and, and, and the two work on. And um, <laughs> I, I ended up putting a, you know, something to love as being having a 500 or a below 500 team that's minus 65 in the season, mm. plus minus in, in the top four um, at the time. Yes. And um, <laughs> but I, I very nearly argued myself into putting that at neither work on because it's no <laughs> good when you've got things that are substandard. Yes. Yeah. But um, but I guess what you want as a league is you want evenness, you want the unpredictability. You know, fans are going to probably not want that mm. <laughs> for their own team. But uh, for, for someone like myself who just loves the game, you you want to see close contests. And uh, yeah, I think we've seen that for the most part this year. And and obviously the evenness is just insane. I've just never seen. I mean, we've said this before. We seem to say it every year. We've never seen anything in a league quite so close. But mm. this year it's even closer again, and it's. It's kind of even more ridiculous. Now, as you said, we're going to look into our crystal balls a little later. <laughs> yes. Uh, after I did that, I actually was scratching my head and thinking, <laughs> well, this is going to be ugly. Mm. <laughs> it's going to be some really ugly records sitting at the top of the top of the pile by yeah. the end of the season. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's an intriguing year. It's certainly one out of the box. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, Tasmania's still third, and they're, they're only at 500. They're 12 and 12. I, I don't think we ever would have imagined a team finishing third and not even being above 500. But, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later because most teams either have – well, a couple of teams have five games to go. Most teams only have three or four games to go. So we'll go through the run home a bit later. But what we did see in round 17, like we've touched on, back on Thursday night, I think the two biggest upsets of the season. So firstly, the South East Melbourne Phoenix beat the Sydney Kings 104-98 to and then the Aurora Hawks beat the Perth Wildcats 95-77. to then on Friday, we saw the New Zealand Breakers, 94, beat the Tasmania Jack Jumpers 88. And Melbourne United, again, put a hurting on the Brisbane Bullets. They certainly enjoy that matchup, 93 to 77. Then the Adelaide 36ers kept on winning under Scott Ninnis, beat the Cairns Taipans 88 to 71. 
And then the Perth Wildcats, they they beat the South East Melbourne Phoenix, but I thought that was a pretty spirited performance again from the Phoenix, 103 to 91. And then on Sunday, the Illawarra Hawks, 89 to 85 over the New Zealand Breakers. And as we touched on, the Sydney Kings, 98 to 86 over Melbourne United. Before we go into those talking points, Simon, what, what to you stood out games over the weekend that we haven't touched on? Was there something that really, really caught your, caught your attention? Oh, obviously the performance of Adelaide and, and Scott Ninnis raising his stakes um, every week in regards to that coaching job. It's just going to be a huge talking point between now and the end of the season. Uh, you know, it seems like Adelaide maybe even had their mind made up that no matter what Scott did, we're going to go for somebody else because they keep drawing the attention of uh, these big-name coaches. But mm. he's, he's just about made the case... Jeez, it would be hard to go past him, isn't it? It is, absolutely is. That that's that stick with Adelaide because I think that's a I think it's a fascinating scenario because I think like you touched on management, so whether it's the ownership or or the the CEO had pretty much decided they wanted to look outside for their their next coach. So they were heavily into Trevor Gleeson before he returned to the NBA. There's a lot of talk around how keen they are on Brian Gorge, and there's even a little bit of talk about how keen they are on luring Modi Mayor out of New Zealand and and Scott Roth is, is another name who I think they did speak to before he re-signed in Tasmania but I mean so I, I kind of get the this is just my opinion I kind of get the impression that management still wants to bring somebody in from the outside but the groundswell of support for Scott Ninnis both from the playing group and from the older heads of the club and the supporters but also the former players led by Brett Maher and everybody in Adelaide they desperately want Scott Ninnis to get the job. It's going to be fascinating which way they go. I mean, which way do you, would you be leaning right now? Oh, I think it's got to be an informed decision and, and based upon a number of parameters that I'm just not privy to. Yeah, sure. um, so I, I, I think when you know you have the opportunity to sign a guy like Brian Gorge in with all the success that he's had in the league and, and, and the cachet that he brings to your club, then I think you do it. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, I think Scott's performances, and, and, and sometimes we get caught up in wins and losses, and ultimately that's what keeps you a job. Mm. But you also want to see what the day-to-day runnings of the club are under his uh, leadership. Yep. And those are things that we don't get to see. Mm. You know, how, how good are the training sessions? How good are the, the, the player interviews? How good are the coaching staff and we get with regards to their scouting? their game planning, as their video break. You want to see the complete package, and only management can really see that and make a fair summation of, okay, he's doing the job that we need done. Mm-hmm. And from the outside, it looks like he's doing everything correct. So I think on this one, geez, what a great, what a whole bunch of great names, though. It sounds to me like Adelaide are coming out with a good coach yes. no matter which direction they go in, yep. if anything, that, they, that is to be you know believed. But... Um, I would like to. And I would like to think that Scott retains the job. You know, not based on romance. I could care less what the ex players and some of those blokes are my mate, but I could care less what any of the ex players have got to say about it. It's got to be a basketball decision. We've seen so many sports in the past where there's a little bit of a. Uh, you, know, you come home with a wet mm. sail. Uh, I think the Richmond Footy Club hiring Jeff Geeson mm. all those years ago. <laughs> and he won yeah. a couple. of at the end of the season, he's got them out in their back pocket in front of the cheer squad and they're going nuts mm. and everybody lost their minds and they sign him for 105 years and have to sack him two years later yep. or with every other coach they have up until dim up. But, um, you know, you think of scenarios like that where they just got lost in the emotion. I, I think that, as I said, I'd love to see Scott get it, but I think they wait until the end of the season, mm. make a really informed, maybe get some outside help in coming to the decision as well yep. and, and make the best decision possible. But, I tell you what, incredibly proud of Scott and what he's done and the way he's turned that club around. And, and uh, regardless of what happens moving forward, he's got a lot to hold his head up uh, high over. And uh, and if he doesn't get this one, then there'll be another opportunity for him somewhere. Mm. What about from the playing group? Would you take into account what the playing group says? I mean, clearly DJ Vasilovic wouldn't re-sign with the club for another three years if he didn't think that there was at least a chance of Scott retaining the job and if he wasn't enjoying playing under Scott. Um, to me, Isaac Humphreys is the other big one. If he's willing to sign on as well with the thinking that Scott could be the coach, do you take the playing group into consideration if you're management or do you try to keep that emotional part of it away from it as well? Yeah, I mean, you certainly can take it for what it's worth, probably worth a little bit more than, say, a fan's vote at the all-star game yeah. um <laughs> you know like is uh yeah i'm gonna take it on board yeah. but yeah we, we're gonna make the decision here because we have to live and die by it so look oh if there's 
people in the club that you feel like you are going to have in the club for the next few years, then certainly listen to what they've got to say. Look, with regards to DJ signing, uh, no, my belief, well, regardless of what I have heard, I heard he signed a number of weeks ago. It's mm-hmm. just been announced now. Yep. Around the time of Scott taking over, so I don't know if you know, they, they hadn't won any games at yeah. the time. So yep. I'm not sure that had a lot of bearing on his re-signing. From a public perspective, I'm sure that will be. But these negotiations quite often go on, and maybe it wasn't signed off but agreed to, or maybe had the league approval, all those things. So who knows when it was signed? Mm. Um, who knows when it was agreed to? So... Again, I'm not going to put too much credence on players signing because yep. at the end of the day, if you throw a nice big check in front of them, they'll they don't care who's coaching. Sure. But I would take in any if there's if there's a guy who's been around the club for a little while and I was the GM, I'd certainly get their information if I was a trusted source. You, you touched on it before, last one on Adelaide um, about from the outside. How do we judge if it's Scott's coaching or if it's the playing group that have been behind their turnaround? Because I clearly it looks like they are being coached well, but could it be as simple as the fact that he's put the faith in, like we touched on last week, DJ and Trey Kell to run the backcourt and just having a focus on Isaac Humphreys? How much does the playing group deserve the credit for turning things around as well? Uh, they certainly deserve a lot of credit. And, and, I, and I don't want to take any of the credit away from Scott because he no, certainly no, sure. does. Um, but we've also had management, from what we're told, <laughs> yes. basically say, well, these are the guys you'll be starting with and uh, make some changes. Mm. So... No, I mean, none of us like to hear of management sort of interfering with coaching, but it, it seems like it's worked in this occasion, if that is the truth. And it comes from pretty good sources that it was uh, how things happened. So uh, the players certainly deserve credit because it's so easy to put the cue in the rack when things aren't going your way. And especially when the, the, the next bloke in charge has got their interim title and it doesn't always garner the respect of the head coach mm. that the head coach does. But also, having said that, when a coach is uh, put to the side and a new guy comes in, well, there's people they're looking at is the players. Yep. So it sometimes motivates player teams, and we've seen it this year with two teams that have replaced their coach, and all of a sudden they start winning. Yeah, it's, there's certainly some players that deserve a lot of credit. It's a great move, obviously, with that backcourt and, and moving Mick, uh, Mitch from the starting lineup. And, uh, you know, Galloway's come in, had really good minutes. That, yep. That's been great for them. That was almost handed to them by Wiley getting injured. Yep. So there's been a little bit of luck there as mm. well. But, yeah, look, uh, I think that the the whole organisation needs credit for the way that they've turned their season around. Been uh, a pleasure to watch. They're playing a fun brand of basketball, and uh, I, I hope it continues. I hope they can sneak in mm. somehow. <laughs> it would be great for the city of Adelaide. They've done it tough, yep. um, and but they've been loyal and they keep turning up. So it'd be good to see a thirty six fans rewarded. Okay, well before we take our first break, yes or no to to these two questions, Simon? Does Scott retain the job for next season? I'm hoping yes, so I'm just going to go with my gut and say yes. Yep, and and lastly, does Adelaide sneak into the top six? We'll, we'll do a full preview uh, later, but what do you think? It, it's going to come down, yeah, it's going to come down to uh, Phoenix in the end, I think. Yeah, and theirs isn't great. They've got the worst outside of everyone but the Phoenix, unfortunately, for them. Yeah, so yeah. that might that might just do them short. Yep, okay. All right, Simon, that's been a, a fun first segment. That's here from Tab Touch. Take our first break, and then we've got plenty more to get through. He'll make it for sure. That's why I backed him on Tap Touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Imagine what you could be buying instead. Okay, back on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. I'm here with Simon Mitchell. We touched on the Sydney Kings off the top of the show. Simon, let's talk a bit more about them. How does a team, this is twice in three weeks now where they've put in a horrible performance on a Thursday night on the road. So three weeks ago it was in in Adelaide. This time it was in Melbourne against the Phoenix. And then three days later, back home on a Sunday afternoon in Sydney, they bounced back and put in a great performance. So last time they destroyed the New Zealand Breakers. And then this time they, they really outplayed Melbourne United from the start. How do you explain it? How does a team go from being that bad on a Thursday night to that good on a, on a Sunday? Yeah, sometimes your pride takes a bit of a, a bit of a beat down on that Thursday, and it kicks in on the Saturday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just primed on the Sunday. So, yeah, look, they've they've, they've had a couple of off Thursday night games, and uh, yeah, that, that that performance against South East Melbourne, I had a good one. I, I decided to cut the tape on this one, mm-hmm. and they were pretty dreadful, yeah. um, to be honest. Now. Firstly, I want to give credit to South East Melbourne and the effort that they put, but it really was one of those games where 
and we'll touch upon South, South East a little bit. But at the end of the day, Sydney's defence is not consistent and it's, it's, it's not of the quality that's going to see them win a championship this year. Mm-hmm. So I just don't see it come into fruition for them now. Um, and their Thursday night performance against South East was one of the worst one-on-one defending nights I think a team's put together where, oh, what did I count? I think it was six straight line drives they mm. gave up in the first half. Yeah, Six straight line drives where they, they were just beaten one-on-one. They got beat behind the arc. They weren't carrying their hands. They were getting caught going under screens against guys. Maybe you shouldn't be going under screens. Their pick and roll coverages were confusing. You know, what were they in? I'm not sure. Mm. They looked disengaged a lot of the time. There's that one possession where Adams is shooting free throws and, and the young fella, Austin Rapp, just goes from lining up at the free throw line to running at the other end and, mm. and blowing a dunk. But, yeah. like, just situations like that, that that's, under 12 stuff. Like, it shouldn't happen at the NBL level where, where you don't know who your matchup is after a free throw. So there's no communication going on. Twice they double team Mitch Creek in the post and he's kicked it back out and then relocated behind a three point line and, mm-hmm. and shot two white threes. In the third quarter, their offense was just horrendous. Six turnovers, five of them were ball handling errors. Yep. So again, disengaged. And after the game, we see Coach Mood say, he's pressed that he wanted the players up the floor and applying pressure. Mm, he did. So yeah. when I went, yeah, and I went back and watched the game. <laughs> was like Sean Bruce was up there. Um, he was doing his job. You could see the moment where they tried to sort of ramp it up a little bit, but no, none of them, his teammates decided to go with him. Mm. So while well, he's going up there and putting pressure on the point guard, it was just an easy uh, reverse pass, and then the other, you know, the four men or the two men would just dribble it up the floor unmolested. So nobody else wanted to roll with Sean Bruce, and um, yeah, and I counted seven completely disengaged plays. So mm. plays where they've just blown it mentally. So yeah, it was a really tough night for, for for them on the on the on the Thursday. Yeah, I don't know what to make of that. I really don't. That was extremely poor. And then <laughs> we see them turn it around yeah. and take on Melbourne United, and it was one of their better performances of the year. Yeah. So um, on this night, you know, all of a sudden they're digging in defensively. Now there were some changes. So one of the one of the main offenders defensively. You know, he had a pretty good game statistically, but one of the worst offenders. Defenders from the defensive standpoint was quite noisy in the southeast Melbourne yes. game. Yep. Um, he got blown past four times. Yep. So when you get beat one on one four times, there, there's probably a little bit of hell to pay. And he, he saw his court time diminish significantly mm. in the Melbourne United game. We see a guy like Angus Glover play a few more. We saw Sean Bruce's best game play a little bit more. And you know those guys got a little bit of defensive edge to them. We saw Jordan Hunter play a little bit more. Um, you know, again, a very good defender. So we saw well, the guys. The biggest with, one to me was Makawaj Molaj. He was incre- he was fantastic. Fantastic. He came in. He played played. You know, against his old team. Yeah. From last year yeah. was tremendously admirable. Um, and and was under very strong consideration for the Galen mm. Award, I might add. But yeah, he's come in and he was playing at both ends. And you just like to see a kid like him um, get rewarded for his defensive efforts. Um, the other thing also I think is the rotation was just streamlined a little bit. Maybe it's for poor defensive efforts on the Thursday night, but you look at the minutes um, and the way they were shelled out in that game um, against South East, you would, you would almost think that they were up by 30. Yeah, It was one of those everybody gets an even go sort of night. And uh, and that sort of, you know, it was a little bit tighter on the Sunday. So great turnaround, um, a lot to like about that, but I'm not impressed Entirely, I want to see a little bit more consistency from them. Do they have time to find that? I mean, they've only got three games to go over the last three weeks. By the end of the season in three weeks' time, are we going to know what the real Sydney team is? I'm not sure we're going to know who anybody is outside <laughs> of those top two teams. So if, if they were to go and win those next four, uh, or next three, sorry, yep. then over the next three weeks, then they will certainly have uh, put themselves in a position to finish in that top four and um, and get home court advantage in that first crossover game. So, yeah, I, I think that's all the first play-in games. Yep. Uh, I think that. I think they've still got time to put it together from that perspective, but I, I don't think it's going to happen for them. Hmm. The team they lost to on the Thursday night, I mean, as bad as the Kings were, the Phoenix were equally as admirable. It was a, an incredible performance. I think Mike Kelly deserves a lot of credit for, there's not a lot he could do in this situation except give guys an opportunity and build their confidence up and put them in roles where they can, can thrive in. But what they did without five of their, I think probably five of their best six players, you, obviously you've got Mitch Creek, but then you don't have any of your three imports and you don't have 
Matt Kenyon and you don't have Craig Moller who set the tone in a lot of ways defensively and, and in their effort and, and hustle and everything everything that they provide. How did the Phoenix do it? Because they were they were really strong against the Wildcats as well. So I think they put together 80 really good minutes of basketball without five of their best six players. How did, how did they do it when they were coming in as low on confidence as they were like we talked about last week? Yeah, I guess these, these games leading into, into this weekend have been pressure games, mm. um, games where your season's on the line. And I think from the vast majority of the basketball public right now we're probably thinking that South East Melbourne's not really a contender for the finals. So that releases a little bit of pressure onto itself. Now mm-hmm. that can work either way for you. It can work in your favour. It's like, okay, now we can have a free swing every week or it can work like, okay, we've got the queue in the rack, we can't make it. You know, a guy like Craig, he's going to be, his pride will have been hurt by the way that the team's performed, so he's going to turn up. Um, and these kids are being given an opportunity. You get a guy like Alan Foxwell who got his real first chance to sort of play some good minutes this year, really. Mm. I mean, add a little bit of edge, um, which the team has been missing. So I, I really enjoyed that. You know, Ben Ayres playing with a bit of edge, but when he's playing with edge and making shots, then he then he's a really tough cover. And uh, what I really enjoyed was uh, Lukey Rosendale, mm. um, who was a team player with us the last two years, and he got the DP role this year, so he's progressed nicely. Come in and just do his role sensationally, just mm. knocking down shots and, and playing honest. And, and the surprise for me was Cody Statman and mm-hmm. his play over the week. Um, I thought that, um, you know, like from what I've seen of Cody, he, he's been in the in high level basketball for what, six, seven years now, yeah. three, four years at Virginia, yes, three or four, and three, three years in the NBL now. Yeah, he still doesn't look like he looks like he still walks past the weight room on yes. the way to the gym, <laughs> and that's for me personally, that's a bit of a concern. It's like, okay, well, where's the definition? Is he, is yeah. he like to work? Is he, what sort of kid is he? I don't know the kid at all. Yeah. Um, I've heard good things about him, but yeah. I, it's just. My eyes are, are telling me another story, and, and and I haven't seen it. You know, for me, to this point, he looks like a shooter who misses shots. Mm. But he was given extended minutes in this weekend, and it was really, really good to see him uh, make some plays. And, and you know, some of his cutting off the ball, and uh, you know, working his feet at the defensive end. Like, there were some things to like about him. So, yeah, a bit of upside there, and I was glad he was able to show the, the basketball world what he's capable of. So, yeah. But the thing I really loved about the whole team. Is they they were opportunistic in the in the game against the Kings. You know they shot the ball extraordinarily well, yes. uh, fifteen or thirty one from deep. Yeah. So that's kind of a little bit of the, uh, I guess the outlier of the performance. But what I really liked was that their nineteen points off turnovers, their sixteen second chance points. Those were indicators of okay, we've come to play. You know they they were willing to work and create opportunities for themselves, create opportunities with their defense, create opportunities from the offensive rebounding. And that's what we've missed over the last six weeks or so. Mm. Um, and that helps you overcome the absences of Williams, Molo, Brown, Nader, and, and, and Kenyon. Um, you know, that's 55 points per game mm. I'm missing there. <laughs> that's a hell of a lot of production. 55 <laughs> points, just under 30, a shade under 30 rebounds, nine, re, uh, nine assists, mm. um, it, yeah. nine and a half offensive scores I'm missing. So that, that, that's an unbelievable p- production yeah. that they had to make up. But it just shows you the depth of the league give kids an opportunity. There's a lot of talent there that's just waiting for their chance. I want to get your thoughts on Mitch Creek because he's been a high-level player in the league for a long time and you've worked with him very closely over the last last four years. Do you think he's playing the best team basketball that he ever has right now, though? He, to me, he looks like a real leader out on the court and I'm not sure he always has previously. What, what are you seeing from Creaky? No, I, I don't. I don't think he's. He, he, I don't think so. No, I don't, I probably disagree with that a little bit. I, oh, that's right. I think he's dropped off a little bit this season. Mm. I, I don't think his performances have been as good. I think he's always been a very vocal player, mm. especially his time at Phoenix. We've had some some teams that are really quiet, mm-hmm. and and we've we've actually consciously tried to recruit guys that have got a bit of uh, spunk and a bit of yap to them, like, like um, because it's been a. Yeah, exactly, and, and because it has been a really quiet group. And um, so Creaky works himself to the bone trying to trying to bring so much life and personality to the team. Yeah. And, 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 and he con- he's continued to do that. But that is a fatiguing um, thing to do as well. And, and that's where, again, when you're talking about balancing your roster, you need to have those players that have a little bit of zip, that have a little bit of swagger, um, because it can't always be coming from the one guy. But look, I think Creaky's always 
done his best to try and provide that leadership. He's certainly on the floor during training, the way he looks after his body, um, his diet, all those things. He, he presents himself as a leader all the time. He's always you know, up and about and talking at practice. So I think he's always been that guy. So I don't know if he's, I've seen it be better this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, maybe it's just a quieter group again. Mm, yeah. Well, especially without Source out there, yeah. I, I can't imagine Statman or Foxwell are the noisiest, noise, noisiest bunch, are they? And, and in fairness, Moller, Kenyon, they're all fairly quiet type of, type guys, aren't they? Moller, Kenyon, Tarangi. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and that Rosetto brings a bit of personality. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, um, I don't know Abdelnader personally. And, you know, Gary Brown doesn't look like he's had his, his usual swag either, for, mm. certainly for the second half of the year. So, so there's certainly been a lot of onus and responsibility on Creek to sort of carry that. Melbourne United, I want to get your thoughts. We saw Shaley and Joe Luala Chul back in the lineup this past weekend, and especially to see Shay back, I think we were all breathed a great sigh of relief to see him back back playing. And we saw we saw the impact they could have, especially against Brisbane on the on the Friday night, especially especially JLA. Watching Aaron Baines try to guard him was not pretty. If you're a Brisbane supporter, he he loved that matchup and dominated that that matchup especially. What did you think about what you saw from Melbourne? I'm not too concerned about them losing to Sydney on the Sunday. It was a short turnaround. It's their last last of this this stretch on the road for the whole of January, and they come up against a team that just just got hot in a lot of ways. Um, but what did you think of what we saw from Melbourne when they were back at back at full strength? Uh, what did I? Think? I think they like Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Uh, I- I don't know if I want to see that in a semi-final series. Um, I know that much. I think it's 63 uh, points over the three games they've outscored them by. Yeah, no, it's been really dominant. And, and, and that performance from JLA, JLA in, in the most recent one, like 33 points. I don't remember any rebounds. Yeah, he did it all in felt like in 20 minutes. So it was, it was just an outstanding. Now he's probably been champion of the bit to get on the floor for a little while yep. but but it uh geez it all uh, all unloaded on on brisbane quickly yeah look i think they're obviously we, we talked about the numbers last week when Shay's playing yeah. and the versatility he brings to their backcourt when he is out there um you know the the addition of those two just makes them a very very strong team i'm maybe a little bit more concerned about the loss on sunday for them yep. um yep. yeah uh, I didn't think they were particularly impressive. Dean certainly looked frustrated, took some early timeouts. and um, I think he regretted it, that too. I think, I, mean, he, I think he felt like he used his yeah. time too quickly. Yeah, it's not the NBA. You don't get the, <laughs> no. a hostel full of them. But mm-hmm. yeah, like they're 3-3 three and three this year. Now, yep. as we know, they've, they've had the tough the road trip. And now um still think they're an incredibly gifted basketball team. They're very, very deep. And if they can string the back end of this season with no injuries, and start to rebuild that chemistry. Yeah, I, I still think they're uh, they're right there along with Perth as the, as the team to beat. I want to get your thoughts on Joe Luala Chul. I mean, let's take Bryce Cotton out of this discussion because we know what he can can do. But is Joe the second hardest guy to, to guard in this league? Because Brisbane pride themselves on their three three bigs with with Aaron Baines, Tyrell Harrison, and Rocco Zakarski. But whether or not Joe was either too strong or too tall or or too fast and too nimble to to go sideways depending on who was trying to stop him. Brisbane's centres had absolutely no hope against him. Is he the toughest guy to stop outside of Bryce in the league? Yeah, he he can be really, really difficult. Um, I mean, he's very aggressive. When he gets the ball, he's he's really aggressive offensively. He used to be be aggressive shooting. Uh, He used to to catch and shoot no, no matter what, yeah. Oh, he, every time he touched it, yeah. you knew it was going up. And, and, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, having that sort of mentality either. Um, if, you, if you're converting at a, a you know an efficient rate, and he generally does, but he's he's become a little bit more um, renowned passing out of the post now. Yeah, yep. I don't think anyone's going to confuse him with Arvidas Sabonis anytime <laughs> soon. But he, he's certainly become a lot more effective in releasing the ball yeah. um, out of the post. Um, and he's just got so many different ways that he can score. Yeah. You know, he, he is a threat from three. Uh, he is a threat off the dribble. We saw that against South East Melbourne when he was isolated uh, against uh, Alan Williams and yeah. his ability is to go one-on-one. Yeah. Um, he's got reasonably good post moves. He can get into that uh, right-hand jump hook, but he's also an upstairs threat in the pick and roll. So he's got a number of ways that he can score, and, um, and he enjoys it. And uh, that one-two punch with him and Hope Porty brings a lot yes. of different looks for the Melbourne United team, and that's one of the reasons they're so so dangerous. No, ab- absolutely. All right, so I mean, let's get 
let's get to what we've been promising to get to. Let's go to the run home for all 10 teams because all 10 teams te- technically can still take part in, in the postseason in one form or another. So like I said, every team's either got three, four or five games to go. We know that Melbourne and Perth are going to finish finish top two. Why don't we do, why don't we figure out who's going to finish top first of all? Do you think it'll be Melbourne who are seventeen and seven stays on top, or does Perth chase them down sixteen and eight? And bearing in mind, I wish it went to head to head records, but it doesn't. So it comes down to percentage, and Melbourne does have a fair a fair advantage there too. I don't think it's going to matter. I think Melbourne are going to finish just that one win ahead of Perth. Yep. Uh, I've got them finishing the season at twenty wins and eight losses. Mm-hmm. And I've got Perth finishing at 19 and 9 to take the second spot. So, yeah, I think uh, Melbourne will do, oh, we won't jump this segment, but I think Melbourne will do it pretty comfortably this weekend. And, yeah, that'll set themselves up for the run home. The Cairns one, though, is going to be a surprise. You know, like we've seen the first two times at Cairns and, and they've been, you know, they've probably gone under the radar so yeah. far this year with regards to their inconsistencies and, and, and perhaps uh, you know, the microscope hasn't been put on them that much. But uh, we know that the one thing we know from Cairns, if we've learnt anything this year, is that they do pretty well against Melbourne. <laughs> yes. So we look forward to that one. Well, that was going to be my question. The one loss you've got for Melbourne, do you expect that to be up in Cairns? Because that's, that's their only road game that they've got to go and it's up in up in Cairns. Would you expect them to drop that one? Uh, I, I did put Cairns in as a win. I, yeah. I think you've got to go on the form and they've, they've been able to do it twice and it's the method of which they do it. Mm. And they've repeated and also added to the method. So I think that they've, they've got a genuine uh, wood on Melbourne and I, I think that we'll see it again. Now, whether or not it results in a win, well, we'll have to wait and see, but uh, I think Cairns will certainly present themselves well in that game. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. So I mean, if you've got those two finishing on twenty and nineteen wins respectively, they potentially they'll finish five games at least ahead of of whoever's next. So let's get to Tasmania next. Right now they're third at twelve and twelve. So they've got they've got Cairns away, Adelaide at home, South East Melbourne away, Perth at home. How many of those four do you do you give them? I've got them winning two. <sighs> I think they're. Uh... I think they're finishing 14 and 14. Yep. I think that's where they are. I think they are a 500 team because they they tend to put in one, one good performance and one pretty average performance, don't they? Yeah, they, 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 they do. Um, but their good performances seem to outweigh their bad performances. They're, they're, no, they, uh, they, they, tend to, they, tend to blow, they tend to blow teams away when they get on top, don't they? They do. And, and when they lose, or even if they get down heavy, they seem they to find up. a way to get yeah. lead in the game. Yeah, and... And, um, yeah, you know that when they're losing the margin, small. But, yeah, I've got them finishing 14 and 14. Yeah, I think that's going to be good enough for third or at least equal third. Yeah, I think so because their percentage is, their percentage is better than everybody's except for Melbourne, including better than Perth. So mm-hmm. um, good luck trying to figure out what's, what's going to happen at the Sydney Kings, Simon, because right now they're fourth. They're 12 and 13. They finish away to Adelaide, home to Illawarra, away to southeast Melbourne. How many of those three do they win? Well, I'm putting them in as a definite win against South East Melbourne since I did such a <laughs> sterling job of last Thursday's uh, prediction. <laughs> but the most fascinating part for me is those two away games in Adelaide and South East Melbourne, they're the two horrible performances they put in the last two Thursday nights they back, are. back in those buildings. They really are. And then obviously you've got the, the cross-town rival mm. in, uh, in Illawarra where Illawarra have shown a little pluckiness of recent times that... Uh, They'll be only too happy to try and knock the Kings out of the top the top six. So, yeah, look, I think between the Adelaide and the Illawarra game, I think they'll win one of those two, and I think they'll lock in the South East game. So I've got them also finishing 14, 14, 14 and 14. Brisbane Bullets. So right now they're 12 and 13. They've got Illawarra, Illawarra away this week. Then they've got Adelaide at home, New Zealand away. How many of those would you give the Bullets? If any. Yeah, I'm going to rain up parade just a little and, and give them one win again. I'm probably going to say between the Illawarra and the Adelaide game, I think they can sneak one of those that I don't know which one. But, yeah, I've got them finishing 13 wins, 15 losses. Then it gets interesting. So we've got the Illawarra Hawks. They've got the most games left, so they've still got five games to go. So they're 11 and 12 right now. They've got Brisbane at home, then New Zealand away, Sydney away, Perth at home, Melbourne away. Ooh, out of the, out of those five, how many would you give them? Yeah, sorry to the Hawkies. I've got them going one win for the remainder of the season. Okay. 
It is, a, it is a tough run, isn't it? It's a tough run home. It's a tough, it's a tough uh, run. Got them in a few 50-50 games, so I'm just trying to split them down the middle on those 50-50 games. But if I'm give, I'm going to give some of those to the other opposition. <laughs> yes. too. So I, I, I've got them winning one. I, I've just got them winning the one. Yep. Cairns Taipans. We know you're giving them the win against Melbourne, but do they get any more? So right now they're 11 and 14. They've got Tasmania at home, Perth away, and then Melbourne at home to finish. I've got them winning one more game. Yep. I've got them getting yep. Melbourne, yep. and that's yep. it. So I've got them also finishing 12 and 16. Yep. New Zealand Breakers. Actually, they do have five games left as well, like the Hawks do. So they're 10 and 13. So they go to Perth this weekend. Then they've got Illawarra at home, Melbourne away, Brisbane at home, Adelaide away. That's another tough, tough run home. It is, but I think they're good enough to snag three of those. Okay. I think there's a, uh, I think there's the trip to New Zealand can be difficult, and I think that they'll get those those wins at home. I see them at thirteen and fifteen also. Yes, <laughs> so they've been locked in with uh, along with Brisbane. Let's see if we have got any hope for the thirty sixes or the Phoenix Adelaide. First of all, ten and fourteen. They've got Sydney at home, Tasmania away, Brisbane away, New Zealand at home. How many? Not many, based on your prediction so far. Yeah, no, I think they can snaffle two of those, potentially. Yep. Yep. And in, uh, in fairness, that won't be enough to get to the top six, but 12 and 16 where they were when Scott took over, that's a that's a good result still. Oh, wonderful effort. And, and look, even if they drop the remainder of these games and, and put in the required effort to mm. give themselves an opportunity to win, I think that's still a pass grade on, on what he's been able to achieve in that second half of the season and what he's been able to achieve in 2024. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, unfortunately for the Adelaide faithful, I hope there's an upset. I hope they can throw a couple of upsets out there, and they can they can also finish with 13 wins. Or, mm. but I, I'm not seeing it right now. I think it's a little too far back in the pack. Yeah, I th- even if they got to 13, their percentage wouldn't allow them to sneak in anyway, unless they blow those teams away in their wins to come, which is probably hard to hard to see. South East Melbourne to finish off with. So they're 10 and 15 right now. To be any hope, they have to win all three of these. So they've got a throwdown this weekend and. then at home to the Jack Jumpers, at home to the Kings. Do they win any of them? I think it's unlikely. I think it's going to be difficult. I think the Melbourne game this week will be really difficult. Uh, Sydney, I don't think, will have a lot of love for them um, and might feel like they're owing one to them. The Tassie one Mm. could be their shot. Yeah. Now, I keep hearing Leonard Copeland saying Tasmania always win at Rod Laver Arena. Mm. Now, he does like to show a little bit of his <laughs> Melbourne Tigers slash Melbourne United bias. says that because the truth of the matter is that they've only ever won one game against South East Melbourne at uh, yeah. Rod Laver. Oh, no. oh, not Rod Laver, at uh, John Cana. Yeah, absolutely. All the, re- all the rest are against it right, United. Yeah. Yes. yeah, it is It is a shared gym. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the, the Jack Jumpers have only ever beat South East Melbourne twice. My uh, my money on this one is that they will get their third window. <laughs> yes, and we remember what they did on Christmas Day. That was a remarkable performance down in Hobart on Christmas Day as well, when they were up against the odds as well. All right, so that's our, that's the that's the run home. So based on all of that, Simon, Melbourne finishes top twenty and eight. Perth finishes second, nineteen and nine. I think based on percentage, Tasmania will stay third, fourteen and fourteen. Sydney stays fourth at fourteen and fourteen. Which two teams will make the playoffs? So you've got Brisbane, Illawarra, and New Zealand all on 13 wins. Which two? I've which got Illawarra. Two? Yeah, I've got Illawarra on 12 wins. 12. Okay. 12. There we go. That's not well. Yeah, I've got them finishing one and four. Unfortunately, no, you, yeah, actually, you did too. Yes, you did. So, so Brisbane and New Zealand. That'd be a fascinating playing game on its own, wouldn't it? It would be. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that will come down to who finishes. Finishes on top. Yeah. 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 So as we know, as we've seen throughout the course of the year, we can look into this crystal ball, but what we're not looking for are injuries and tweaks and yes. twists and turns. And um, yeah, but I think at the end of it, this was really difficult. Um, mm. And uh, what we're going to come up with is just an extraordinary uh, last three weeks of basketball. Yeah. And, it, and again, it just shows how even it is because... Pretty much all of those games are 50-50, so, I mean, they could go either way. So, But that was good fun to go through it all. I'm going to keep these these written down, Simon, and in three weeks' time we'll see how close you got. I uh, can only do poorly, can't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it does, no matter who was doing it, 
the chances of getting it getting it right and being able to see into the future is pretty pretty thin. So um, you're sort of setting yourself up for failure. But I put you in this position, so it's it's half my fault. All right, well, good. <laughs> uh, okay, let's take a break, Simon. We'll hear from Tap Touch. Then we, when we come back, we'll get your Galen winner. We'll preview round eighteen, and I'm going to throw a curly one out to you about some of the little little rivalries we've got building between some players across the league to finish off. He'll make it for sure. That's why I backed him on Tap Touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Imagine what you could be buying instead. Okay, back on Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle. I'm here with Simon Mitchell once again. Let's go through our awards quickly from, from last week and then we'll get stuck into our round 18 preview, Simon. Before we get your Galen winner, I couldn't help but chuckle when I got the votes from Damien Martin in his Best Defensive Player Award because it was either a Perth Wildcats current player or a former teammate of Damo's that got the vote. So Alex Sar got his, his three votes, then it was Luke Travers, and then it was Wani Swaka Lobaluk. Maybe on the same weekend where his jersey's about to head into the rafters, he felt like he had some, some sucking up to do. <laughs> well, as I expressed to you in my, uh, my message regarding uh, going with Owen Foxwell, I, I had to really think hard on this one mm. because I was like, you know, I want to make sure I'm not being biased. <laughs> I know I've got a little bit of a thing for Foxy and I've got a little bit of a thing for players that are, you know, been sitting there patiently waiting their turn. Mm. And um, and he's been sitting there waiting, wait, patiently waiting his turn, and he got the opportunities on the weekend. Average eleven and a half points, four and a half rebounds. Uh, sorry, five rebounds, four and a half assists. Like he was excellent. Yes, the Foxy was unreal. So he got my game, but I was really worried about <laughs> the, the the calls for bias. Yes, and then I saw Damos, and I was like, oh, forget about it. He's got three Wildcats. I don't have anything to worry about here. No, no, you didn't. The other thing I loved about Foxwell, I mean, not only did he do those numbers, but for most of those two games, he was either guarding Jalen Adams or Bryce Cotton. That's what I loved about him. And he, and he shows no fear when he's guarding those guys. No, he, he, he's, he's, he doesn't possess any fear. He's a physical kid. He certainly puts his body on the line. He takes a charge as good as anyone in mm. the league and, uh, and, and puts his chin in dangerous places yes. at times. And, um, and it's one of the reasons why he endeared himself so much to me is that uh, I really like players with that little bit of edge and, and are prepared to take a hit. He certainly doesn't shell them out, but he certainly wears them. And, um, you know, he plays with, uh, with all the passion that you want. And, um, you know, he, he's probably not the, the most spectacular kid out there. He's probably not the eye catcher so to speak, from a skill standpoint. But when you see the, the, the package he puts together, it's uh, the blood and guts package that he's mm. got. Um, combined with his talents, he's, uh, he's a heck of a ball player and I think he's got a long future in, that, in the NBL. No, for sure. And how could you not be happy for him when he got that layup at the end after after a steal to seal, seal, seal that game on? On Thursday night, I mean, you just couldn't help. That was a ripper of a yeah. finish, yeah. No, it was a really good finish. Uh, it was a little bit of a pseudo floater, flat-looking <laughs> thing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but he got to his left, and he's pretty trusty when he gets to his yeah. left. So yeah, it was, a, it was a good little finish for him. And yeah, no, he was excellent. And again, I thought he was he was pretty good uh, defensively um, in some minutes against Bryce. Yeah. You know, he commits at that end of the floor. There's still some some room for him to grow in that uh, at the defensive end. I, I think he's got the ability. And certainly the the character and heart to become an elite defender. Yeah. Um, he's uh, he's just got a little ways to go with in regards to reading the play and, and maintaining his focus. So if he can do that, I think he's uh, he can become one of the better defenders in the NBL. He's got plenty of time. He's only twenty, isn't he? Is he twenty or twenty one? Yeah, young fella. Yep. Yeah. So there we go. So well done to to Owen Foxwell. Let's move on to round eighteen now, Simon. Thanks to Tab Touch. So check out all the odds at tabtouch.com.au or download the app at at Tab Touch and jump on the iPhone, iTunes store or the Play Store and you can get the app there and we'll help you find some winners. Let's see how we go, Simon. Starts on Thursday night. Almost an elimination game, this one, for the Cairns Taipans. They don't have much much, much room for error now in their run home. They're at home to the Tasmania Jack Jumpers, though, and if history tells us anything, they, they usually bounce back pretty well coming off a loss. Yeah, they often string two bad ones together. Um... This is a really big game for Cairns Taipans, as I mentioned earlier. They've probably gone under the radar a little bit this year. Um, they certainly haven't strung a consistent season together, nor have the Jack Jumpers mm. for that matter. But uh, I feel like the conditions 
in a, in, a, in a in a tight ball game when you're trying to pick a winner. I think the conditions up in Cairns and Cairns being at home and the magnitude of this game for Cairns and their fortunes. I'm going for Cairns at home on a Thursday night. Mm. One more game on Friday night as well, and this this is a big one. I mean, the Adelaide 36ers and the Sydney Kings. Do we see a repeat of a couple of Thursday nights ago, or does Sydney find a way to bounce back on the road? What are, what are we expecting? I'm not sure we'll see the repeat in the it happens the same way, but I'm certainly jumped on the 36ers bandwagon, mm-hmm. and uh, I've got the 36ers getting up on this one. I want to throw a question at you about the Sydney Kings. I'm almost convinced we're not going to see DJ Hogue again, just because we're hearing no updates about his shoulder, and he, he never looked right even when he did come back. If you were a betting man, do we see DJ Hogue again in a Kings uniform? I think they'll make the finals, and I think we might see him in the finals. There we go. There we go. All right, we'll, we'll keep an eye out. Okay, so now we've got double headers across the weekend. So first up on Saturday, we're getting to a point where this is almost an elimination game as well for, the, for these two teams. We're in Wollongong. The Illawarra Hawks against the Brisbane Bullets. Who have you got? I'm going with the Hawks with one victory left in the tank, and this is it. <laughs> this is it, yes. <laughs> um, next up is a throwdown. Melbourne United will be relieved to be back home after, well, this is their first home game in all of 2024 after, after losing their home venue. South East Melbourne have been able to play a couple of games at the State Basketball Centre, but I'm sure they'll enjoy being back in John Kane Arena as well. What do you think? Do you give the Phoenix any hope? No, I don't. Mm. I, I I don't see it happening. Uh, Melbourne haven't lost two back-to-back this year, and when they have lost, they've come back and put teams to the sword. And, especially uh, Brisbane, usually. Especially Brisbane, yeah. <laughs> they seem to have been on the wrong end of a few Melbourne losses. And, um, yeah, I think um, there will be a uh, an element of ruthlessness in the way Melbourne United approach this game in front of their home crowd uh, back in Melbourne. So. Yeah, got Melbourne United in that one. Yes, it's it's kind of hard to see anything anything else. Two big games on Sunday though as well. These will have big implications as well. First up, Tasmania Jack Jumpers. They're at home. The Adelaide Thirty Sixes. Both teams have played already on the weekend. Jack Jumpers in Cairns on Thursday, and Adelaide have got the short straw, so they have a game Friday night and then the first game on a Sunday, which is has proven tough for some teams this season. I'm sure Scott Ninnis won't be making any excuses, though. We won't be hearing him talk about the travel. But what do we? What do you expect in the game? Yeah, it's hard for me to get over the uh, the the travel in this one. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tight turnaround, <laughs> and uh, I think the Jackies at home. I think they get this one. I know they're coming from the Thursday night up in Cairns and they can take a little bit out of you and there's a little bit of extra travel, but that one night's rest and back at home and in their own beds, I think they'll get Adelaide on this one. And that is, again, you know, they're a 500 team. If they're going to lose one on Thursday, I've got to have them win on Sunday. Yes. Um, last game of the round. Before I get to the game, the Perth Wildcats and the New Zealand Breakers, I want to get your thoughts on Damien Martin as somebody that coached against him. He's number 53, will be heading up into the rafters at RSC Arena on Sunday. It's a big day. Big day for him. He's a guy I've, I've known for 15 years now. I remember the first time he came to, came to Perth, and I've known him ever since. He was co-host of this show for a little while, and I've had a fair bit to do with him before he abandoned us to go to his full-time job at SEN. Um, but big day for, for Damo. As somebody who coached against him, not only in the last four years, but going beyond that when you were at Melbourne United as well, when you send your point guards out there, do you try to almost tell them to almost play second fiddle and try to just take Damo out of the game because of how impactful he could be defensively? What was he like to coach against? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Of the first, I, I reckon I was an assistant coach at Melbourne Tigers back when, uh, was it Melbourne? Yeah, I think it was Melbourne Tigers back mm-hmm. when he um, was when at uh, West Sydney. Yes, yes, yes. Or Sydney Spirit or whatever they were called, the Razorbacks. Oh, I can't remember what. Uh, can't, can't, I'm can't, sure he's at both. I'm sure he had a season there. at the Razorbacks, a season at the Spirit, and then he and then he followed Bevo to, to Perth. He went to Perth, yeah. So, yeah, I think I go back to his rookie season. Damo is an absolute superstar. Um, I actually don't know Damo. Mm-hmm. Um, I've only obsessed from him from a coaching <laughs> standpoint. <Yes. laughs> but oh, he is... Like Shay Ely, one of my all-time favourite players that uh, I've never had the opportunity to coach. Courage personified, toughness, maybe the greatest leader in the history of the NBL mm. from my standpoint. From, and I just can't think of anyone who 
who led his team better yeah. than Damian Martin. Obviously, we know what he did defensively. It didn't really matter if you tell your point guards about <laughs> Damo. It was everybody on the floor because he yeah. guarded all five blokes yeah. in every possession. Yeah. You know, he was a... He, it was he was one of that rare defenders where he could flat out stop someone one on one, but he was also a gambler. Yep, and he could make great reads on doubling the posts, great reads in the passing lanes. He had that innate ability which you don't often see. You know, great defenders sometimes they're lockdown guys, mm. but he had the ability in the wingspan. He got so many deflections. And he's probably one of only a handful of blokes that have played in the NBL who could take a charge with both feet in the air and lane <laughs> sideways. Yes. Um, he certainly got some good whistles there in Perth. So mm-hmm. I hope when they, uh, the 53 <laughs> goes up, someone yells charge, they blow a whistle and uh, everybody roars because we've seen that a lot of times through the years and been on the wrong end of those. So he's an absolute superstar. Comes across as being one of the absolute best blokes you'd ever meet. As I said, haven't met him. Yep. Um, other than to shake his hand and say good day. Did, but, he, did uh, he interview interview you any pre games when you came to Perth for the last couple of years? Uh, I think I got Greg Hire. Ah, okay. Another bloke who you know from, on those Perth teams who I just adored. Yep. I love yep. the way he went about it. And, and guys, you're like, geez, I just wish I could get those blokes because they're the blokes who win your championships. Mm. So no, I never had Damo in that that way either. So yeah, look, just a superstar. It's very rare to see players dominate a game and score five points mm. like to be the best player on the floor and look there's only a handful of blokes like in, in, in the history of basketball that I've seen dominate a game to the level that he has defensively yeah. um, I mentioned them last week when we talked about Shea Hilly mm. and, yeah. and I put Damo ahead of Shea as, as much as I admire Shea I think Damo especially a young Damian Martin just had a, a little bit more strength and uh, and just a little bit more intuition on when to, to, to go for steals. But, yeah, I put him, I think of guys like Gary Payton and Dennis Rodman. Those are the mm. names that come to my mind when I think of Damian Martin, like just the, the way that he could just completely reverse the, the momentum of a game and control a game from a defensive standpoint. Yeah. Amazing player. Yeah, absolutely. So only fitting that his number 53 will be up in the rafters. As for the game itself, it's probably fitting that it's also the New Zealand Breakers. So the great rivals of his of his career, they they almost were just going championship for championship against each other for a lot of his his career. Who wins the game, Wildcats against the Breakers on Sunday? Uh, I'm going with Perth. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I don't think it will be is a 59 to 63 scoreline <laughs> like the old Perth New <laughs> no. Zealand Breakers. No, be like it more <laughs> more like 163 to 159. Mm. But yeah, look. The Wildcats, for me, on this one at home um, in a big game, it'll be a good game. I think along with the Illawarra-Brisbane game, these are the two games of the round. No, absolutely. So check out Tab Touch and find all the odds for those games, and we'll be back next week to see how our, how our predictions went, Simon. Um, one more question I want to throw your way before we wrap things up. We're seeing some interesting little rivalries between some players come up throughout the season. I think Sean Bruce and Matthew Delavidova have clearly got a bit of a love-hate relationship. I think it's fair to say Aaron Baines and Lat Mayen as well. And Coit Noy just loves to pick a fight with anybody, so he doesn't he doesn't really mind who's on the other other end of it. Come the end of the season, who would you like to see in a boxing ring from the NBL come up against each other? <laughs> Sean Bruce and Matthew Delavadova. Well, I think... Matthew Delavid, I love my boxing, firstly. Yeah. I'm going to state that. If Daly was a fighter, he would be Sam Solomon. Mm. He'd be that bloke who's in incredible shape. Nothing makes sense when you're watching him fight. <laughs> <laughs> he's got no technique, yeah. nothing. You're looking at him like, this bloke is just horrible. <laughs> but somehow, he's amazing. Um, Daly, he's far, yeah, I'm probably digressing a little bit. And, and even Sam Solomon is a wonderful uh, contender for a championship. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Uh, He's just very unorthodox and, 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 and a great scrapper without being a great technician. Yep. Shawnee Bruce, uh, he'd probably be Anthony Mundine, wouldn't he? Like <laughs> he absolutely would. Talking it up, yeah. yapping it up all game long and um, and then probably not throwing a whole lot of uh, punches. So <laughs> I'd probably uh, I'd, I'd tip, Matt, uh, I'd tip Sammy Solomon in a wrestling match. <laughs> oh, yeah. But clearly they don't like each other, do they? I mean, look at these last two Sydney-Melbourne games. They No, they don't. Yeah. It's been a cut. Look, I love what Sean Bruce brought to the game against Melbourne the other day. Like he, he's drawing on everything in that game that mm. he possesses 
to contribute to his team's success. And he was getting under the under the skin. It looked like of Dean Beckerman. He was getting under the skin mm. of all the players, and and then he had a little bit of pro, you know, productivity from a basketball standpoint as well. So even Big Joe, he got in his way a few times too. Yeah, yeah, just down the stretch of the game there, he gave him a little reminder yes. that you know how you guys lost back to the airport. <laughs> so yeah, look, Sean, Sean's at that stage of his career where look, and he's always been yappy and always been a feisty character. Mm. But but he's at that stage of his career where he has to draw on all those things to to, to affect games. You see it a lot with players. You know, he's, yep. he's not quite as quick as he once was, and he hasn't shot the ball at a particularly high rate this year, despite Derek Rucker telling us part of uh, DR basketball and mm. shooting at forty percent. He's in the low twenties, so he is drawing on all that veteran now to to contribute, and uh, I find that extremely admirable. Mm. No, absolutely. Once the season's over for those two, maybe we can arrange something, get them in a boxing ring and let them settle it between hey, themselves. The, the, the other ones were good too, though. Aaron Baines and Lat May Aaron. Mm. That, that <laughs> yeah, I, I, I probably have Aaron Baines as Tommy Morrison, you know, huge, big, buff guy and uh, throws a good hook, but may have a bit of a, a weak chin and he, um, he, from he, what we've seen. He wouldn't He wouldn't get many punches out either, <laughs> would he? I mean, he would have to, you have to land his first couple or he might not, not have many left. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, I mean, Lat, Lat Man would, would be Roy James Jr. He's probably <laughs> a middleweight fight. He waits and, um, yeah, you might have to just stay the clear, stay out the way and win on points. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and I reckon Courtney would just take on a gauntlet. He would just want one, one after another. Well, yeah, I had Courtney as Arturo Gatti. Yeah, he, <laughs> I had him as Arturo Gatti. Um, he, he might be throwing a whole bunch of punches, but there's not a lot of defense going on, so he might have to wear it. Uh, yes, yes, I, I think so. The one I'd like to see, though, is Nick Creek completely. They've got some history as oh, well. Oh, they, they do. Absolutely do. do. Do the Phoenix play the Hawks again? I don't think they do. Which is a shame. No. No. So we might have to might have to wait for that in the boxing ring if we're not going to see it on the court. Oh, well, these aren't real fights? No, no I thought we, I thought no, we were having a fight no, night. No, we're, we're, we're starting to organise it now. That, we're we're getting, it, getting it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I reckon Creaky would jump at the chance, wouldn't he? He would love to jump in a boxing ring. He doesn't mind getting in the in the ring and, yeah. and sparring a little. Um, he, he does a lot of things to try and keep fit in the off season, and, and, and he, he goes and does some workouts with boxing trainers. And mm. Yeah, I think he handles himself pretty pretty well. Yes. So yeah, Mason might be in a, in a little <laughs> bit of bother there if we were to officially put the gloves on and <laughs> take the robes off, and it could be a bit of a bit of carnage. <laughs> yes, it, it could be over quickly. All right, Simon, that's that's enough enough of that. Been fun to pick your brain again, though. Thank you for. All of your insights, and thank you to Hoop7 for making it possible once more, and thank you to TabTouch, so check out TabTouch for all of your odds for this week's action. I'm Chris Pike, I'll sign off there, and, and Simon, I'm not sure what's on your mind, but whatever is on your mind, why don't you finish it off for this week? Yeah, hold on tight. I'm going to be some really disappointed fans out there, but there's going to be some who are over the moon, and this is what you love about sport, isn't it? It's just the human drama, the element that close contests bring and um, we're seeing the run home of some very close contests and every game matters from here on in so everyone's playing for position and jockeying for position or playoff spots and uh, it's wonderful to have a season that comes down this late where every, everybody's got something to play for He'll make it for sure now that's why I backed him on Tap Touch. Hey, Luke. Yes, Gene Simmons. He's probably the best when it comes to this stuff. Thanks, Gene. You've got the touch. You got the touch. You got the power. Got the touch? Choose Tap Touch. Better your bet. Download the app today. Chances are you're about to lose. For free and confidential support, call 1 800 858 858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au.